Hello. Uh, I'd say it's lovely to see so many of you, but I literally can't see any of you with the lighting here. Uh, but in any case, I'm going to assume that everything is just fine. If you all leave, I won't be able to tell. <laughs> I've got 30 minutes. I've got about 30 slides. We've got a lot of information to cover. Um, some of it contains very bad jokes, but the majority of this is allegedly actual content. Uh, also, I've once again, while successfully getting into the country without being arrested, failed to do the get into a field in England during the summer while bringing antihistamines. So if I sound congested, my apologies. I'm, it's okay. I'm in a great deal of pain as well. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover. We are going to be talking about a topic that includes social engineering. We're going to be giving you an introduction to what a library is in the first place. We're going to be talking about some ways in which code was interestingly obfuscated. And we're going to answer the burning question I'm sure you all have. Is this something that we can blame on system D? XZ, XZ, whichever, I'll let you choose, uh, is an implementation of the LZ, LZ MA compression algorithm, which was invented back in the 90s. It's a reasonably modern compression algorithm. Uh, one of the things that is key to LZMA is that it is a lossless compression algorithm, whereas most modern compression algorithms, stuff like H.264, stuff like MPEG-2, whatever, those things, they compress a file, some data, into something smaller by throwing some of it away and making calculations based on how humans perceive things. Unfortunately, computers are much less forgiving when it comes to perceiving things. Computers have strong ideas about what they expect. And so when we compress data that's going to be used by a computer, we normally want that to be lossless. We want the output of the decompression to be identical to whatever went into the compressor. And it's been kind of less exciting a pro a, a progress in that field since the 90s. So stuff that was state-of-the-art in the 90s is still relatively modern now. It takes a while until stuff really gets implemented. So XZ is an implementation of the algorithm. It's a set of tools that you can use to compress things, to decompress things, but it's also a library that can be used by other things. Many components of Linux to make use of this in order to perform this compression and decompression. But first, if we're going to talk about libraries, we want to know what a library is. And there's a straightforward answer. A library is somewhere where information is kept and you can borrow it and you can make use of it. You go to the library, you find the book you want, and you either look at it there, you take it home with you, ideally you bring it back. But in computer terms, what's a library? And here is a picture of one of the earliest implementations of a computer library. This is a still from a short film about uh, the EDZAC, the computer that was built in Cambridge by the Mathematical Laboratory in the late 40s, arguably one of the world's first general purpose programmable computers. It was programs for the EDZAC were in the form of paper tape, a real well, a line of paper with holes punched in it. When you were writing software for the EDSAC, a committee would look at your proposed software and would point out that this algorithm had already been implemented and you did not need to implement it again. Instead, the programmer whose job it was to take your algorithm and turn that into a piece of paper would go to the code library, remove the piece of tape that contains that existing implementation of an algorithm, and then put that through a machine that would copy it into your program. So the library of code is literally, in the old terms, equivalent to a library of books. You would go there, you would extract the knowledge you want, you would make use of it. In computer terms, it's basically, in modern terms, it's basically the same, except it's a file on disk. And there are two broad categories of libraries these days. There are static libraries and there are dynamic libraries. When you want to make use of code in a static library, when you build your application, the code is directly copied out of that static library into your program. If it's a dynamic library, then that happens at runtime instead. And that means that there's a key distinction between static libraries and dynamic libraries, which is that when you upgrade a dynamic library, any program that makes use of that dynamic library now gets the new version of the code in that library without you having to rebuild it first. So if I'm running a piece of software against the library that has a bug in, I can deal with that bug by just upgrading the library. I do not need to rebuild the program that's using the library. 
This is great in various ways. It's bad in other ways. I'm not getting into everything now. This is just where we are. Anyway, that's a technical topic. This is not a technical topic. Open source. How many of you would say that you are an open source maintainer? I'm going to ask you to shout because I can't see your hands. Wow, that's far too many of you. Find more mentally healthy things to do with your life. <laughs> So being an open source maintainer is, well, it all sounds like fun and games, and then people file bugs, people file pull requests, people want you to incorporate code, people want you to write code. It's a lot of work. And if you do this for enough time, then eventually people will go from the, hi, I really love your project, here's a small little thing that I think would make everyone's lives better, and you're, oh, that's brilliant, I love doing this, this makes my life so much better, to suddenly, Hi, I need you to incorporate this feature. We're shipping a product next month that takes care of it, and this is several billion dollars in revenue. And if you don't ship that, then we're going to threaten to sue you. And that's less fun. It's very easy to become burned out as an open source maintainer, especially if there's anything else going on in your life at the same time. And obviously, what you should not do is just disappear into a hole and let the project decay. Um, Definitely never done that. Uh, instead, you should find someone else to offer to maintain the project for you. In an ideal world, you would find a team of people who are all then willing to share the load and make life easier for everyone. But if you're going to find someone to do this, it needs to be someone you trust. And ideally, it's someone who understands the project. It should be someone who has a background in contributing to it, someone who's able to meaningfully understand the code base, someone who you believe can take this forwards without destroying your legacy. Ideally, they'll do a much better job of it than you will. So, um, someone, something, an organization, we're not clear. An identity under the name Jia Tan appeared back in um, around 2022. And their first contribution was to a project called LibArchive. And um, you're probably not able to read this, but basically they added an additional print statement that gave, in an error case, slightly more information than was otherwise present. But in the process, they replaced a call to a function called safe underscore fprintf, which removed escape characters before printing something and replaced it just with fprintf. Now, by and large, taking something that says safe and replacing it with something that doesn't say safe is a little bit odd, especially if you're not explaining why you're doing so in the first place. No one's really found any evidence that this in itself was malicious, but you can imagine a universe in which later on additional information could be printed that could include escape characters, which would then mess up your terminal and could potentially result in weird, unexpected behaviors. So this is not in itself direct evidence of hostile action, but it feels kind of bad. A few months later, uh, Giotan sends a contribution to the XZ project mailing list. And it feels like a fairly reasonable patch. It introduces a new feature, and it generates some discussion. A couple of other people who have never previously been heard of on the list pop up and have opinions on this as well. And then someone who we have never heard of before, can find no evidence of existing up until this point, starts demanding that this feature be merged because it is very useful. And then when it's not immediately merged, starts demanding that a new maintainer be found so that new features can actually be merged into XZ. And the existing maintainer, uh, Lasse Colin, is at this point fairly burned out on maintaining this project. Uh, there's not been a new release for several years. Distributions that are carrying it are generally patching the version of the code that they're shipping in order to fix various bugs. Stuff that's been incorporated into upstream but hasn't been shipped yet as a formal release. And Jia communicates with Lasse, there appears to be a fairly good amount of uh, technical discussion and various patches that are authored by Jia are merged by Lasse. Um, so this is at the point where 
we now have someone who we previously never heard of, but has built a good functioning social professional relationship with the existing maintainer and is now able to, without too much difficulty, have their code merged into the project. But at this point, it's still going through someone else first. Until we get to January 2023, at which point it is already possible for Giotan to merge code directly. They are now a maintainer of the project. They do not need to ask for anyone else's approval before they can merge code. We now have another person, um, Hans Jensen. Um, again, no evidence of this person existing before this point, uh, no evidence of this person existing after this point either. Hans adds a feature to XE, which is intended to improve its performance. Now, the GNU C library, I'll get to this in a moment, has support for using different implementations of functions based on various factors, and we'll get to why in a second. And Hans has an implementation that makes use of this and asserts that he has a he, they, she, we don't know. Um, no evidence of the actual human associated with this. But this test case apparently improves performance by four to five percent. And this is enough to convince Blase that this is something worth pursuing and Gia merges this. Hans does not interact with the XZ community again, but does file various bug reports inside Debian asking them to upgrade various features before, uh, various packages before the next release, and one of those is XZ. So an iFunk, um, Different CPUs have different characteristics. They go fast in different ways. Something that goes fast on one CPU does not necessarily go fast on all CPUs. And even within a model range, this may be the case. What is ideal on a specific Intel CPU is not necessarily ideal for another Intel CPU, let alone on AMD, VIA, anything else. And once we start getting into PowerPC, once we start getting into ARM, it gets even more complicated. But you don't want to have to build a separate copy of your code for every single CPU that it could conceivably run on. So what do you do instead? The answer is, in your code, you put all the optimized versions, and then at runtime, you choose which of those to use. Now, in the old days, those of you who are familiar with C, you would think, well, okay, the straightforward way to do this is with a function pointer. You have a variable inside the code, and when you load the code, you check what CPU you're running on, you decide which version of the function is going to be fastest, and then you set this variable to point at this code, but that's um, the correct version. And then when you want to execute that function, you look up the value of the pointer to that code in this variable and execute that. That works perfectly, but it means there's an indirection in the execution of that call, and that slows things down slightly. The idea of an iFunk is at startup, the runtime dynamic linker, the thing that is responsible for taking the code in a dynamic library and integrating that into the application that you are starting, will execute a function inside the library that will tell it which version of a function to use and will then point will integrate that version into the running code. And this allows you to have the same degree of choice. You choose the correct version of this function for the CPU you're running on without the performance overhead of a function pointer. So this sounds great. Uh, so using iFunks rather than function pointers, Hans asserted gave you a 45% performance benefit. This will become important later. There's a few things that iFunks have difficulty with. They, um, they don't integrate well with some debugging parameters that are often used by fuzzing programs. Uh, Clang, the uh, LLVM-based C compiler, sees that a function is defined, but that function is never directly called because the runtime dynamic linker does magic. And Clang is, hey, there's a function here that's never used. Is that deliberate? They're not big issues. Um, the failure for the fuzzer to work with iFunk things is expected due to how OSS fuzz works. Clang complaining about this was a bug, but it's basically cosmetic. 
Geotan submitted patches that rectified these things. So that all seemed fine. Uh, there's not a... Uh, to be clear, these patches were fixing legitimate issues. These made it less obvious that anything weird was going to be going on, but the issues that the patches that Geotan submitted for these were fixing genuine issues. Move forward to February 2024. And this is where a backdoor is inserted in an incredibly devious manner. Two new tests are added, and two new test files are added for these tests to make use of. Both of them are intended to exercise failure modes that were not previously tested for. One is a compressed file that ends unexpectedly. One is a compressed file that has allegedly garbage data inserted into the middle of it. You can't extract either of these files directly because they're corrupted files. It's expected that trying to extract them fails, and these tests are allegedly introduced such that you can make sure that they fail in the expected way with the expected error message. Unfortunately, the data within these files is not random test data. It's actually encrypted code. Let's go off on a tangent for a moment. Um, again, going to ask you to shout or maybe scream or maybe just boo. Uh, how many of you have worked with GNU Auto Tools? Excellent. Um, I'm very sorry for your loss. Auto Tools is a suite of utilities that basically uh, results in, uh, if those of you who have built software on Unix type operating systems where you type dot slash configure, and then it prints stuff like checking whether two plus two equals four, and checking whether your computer was made after 1947. That's Auto Tools. Auto Tools is a way for you to test for the functionality available on the system so that you can nominally build more portable code. AutoTools, however, has one giant problem. It's written in a macro language called M4. It incorporates a bunch of shell code. It's normal for the actual files that end up building the configure script not to be in your source repository because those are pulled in from elsewhere when you build the final scripts that will be incorporated into the release. This is normal. What happened in this case was that one of the files that is incorporated when you're building the release did not come from the expected upstream source, but instead had some extra code added into it. And this code, when run, would check whether you were on a Debian or Fedora-based system, and if so, would then extract another script from one of the test data files, which would then extract another script, which would then extract and decrypt the actual payload. And the actual payload was a .o file, a chunk of compiled x86 code. Now, the decryption is interesting because at this point, it's having to do all of this in shell. Uh, so what this does is implement the RC4 encryption algorithm, which is not a modern good encryption algorithm. It implements it in ORC. <laughs> and even more impressively, this script has support for kind of extensions. It would be a little bit obvious if every time you want to update your backdoor, you had to replace the existing test data with different test data. So it actually has support for looking at the other test data files to see whether any of them have a specific header and then extracting information from those as well and then executing that code, which would allow them to basically hot patch the initial thing by adding new test data, new tests. And this would be obfuscated in the same way. Anyway, in the end, it ends up producing a .o file, which is dropped into the build directory, and then that file is linked into the final library instead of the file that is created by the compilation process. So you now have a libxz that contains this backdoor, and this is where we go back to ifunc. When you start an application that is linking against a library that has ifunc support, the runtime dynamic linker executes, executes a function in there, in that library, which is intended to allow it to um, give back a pointer to the preferred implementation. And this is called twice. This is called for CRC32, this is called for CRC64. So uh, slightly redundancy checks, those two implementations, 64 bit implementation. 
And that function has a counter in it. The first time it's called is for CRC32, and it does nothing. For CRC64, it checks whether the content of argv0, as is the name of the process, is user sbin sshd. And if it is, it walks through the list of imported functions, and it replaces RSA public decrypt with a function that is in the backdoor file instead. Except it's not actually that easy, because RSA public decrypt is, in, is not in SSHD itself. It's in libcrypto. And you don't know in advance what order libraries are going to be executed in. So libxz could be imported before libcrypto. And in that case, RSA public decrypt isn't there yet. So to deal with this, the function installs a hook. The runtime dynamic linker has support for you asking it to audit certain things so that information could be put into audit files. You could use it for debugging purposes. You can use it for security purposes. But basically, that means that every time a certain feature is called, it will call back into the function that you registered as a hook here. So it installs an audit hook, and every time a new library is loaded, that audit hook is executed. And the audit hook scans to see whether the new library that was just loaded added RSA public decrypt, and if so, it replaces RSA public decrypt with a pointer back into the backdoor code. But SSHD doesn't use libxz. Nothing in SSHD ever uses libxz. However, those of you who have used Linux distributions that make use of systemd, which is probably most of you at some point or another, systemd has support for verifying that a process has finished starting up correctly, which allows you to do things like say, I'm not, this thing that depends on this other thing being ready I'm not going to start it until this thing says it's ready. And there's a few heuristics you can use to determine whether something's ready. Like, you can wait for it to fork twice. It doesn't always work, because that can mean it's gone into the background. That doesn't mean that it's opened its network sockets yet. It doesn't mean that it's ready to listen for an incoming connection. And if you start something and then immediately attempts to connect, that'll fail. So systemd adds a very simple protocol that allows you to tell systemd, I am now ready to accept incoming connections. I've finished my startup. I am completely running. Things that depend on me can now make use of me. And there's an implementation of this in a library that is shipped with systemd called libsystemd. And that means you don't need to implement this yourself. You can just link against libsystemd and then call uh, sd, notify, whatever, and then systemd knows that you're ready to run. Uh, libsystemd has functionality for doing that, but it also includes functionality for dealing with various other things implemented by systemd, which include the compressed journal files that systemd implements, which means that libsystemd itself links against libxz, which means if you link against libsystemd, you then pull in libxz as well. So the distributions that patched sshd to make use of this systemd functionality then pulled in libxz as well. And unfortunately, this is how the backdoor ends up being able to attack SSHD. Now, the backdoor itself is impressive. Uh, so if an inbound connection comes in and presents an SSH certificate, now, most connections do not use SSH certificates. They're mostly only used in some corporate environments or various other special cases. But if there's a certificate present, that gets passed to RSA public decrypt. And that code looks to see whether there's a special header inside the SSH certificate. And if so, it interprets the n value, that is, the, the prime number that makes up the RSA public key. It interprets that as a payload, as opposed to an RSA key. And the payload is cryptographically signed. It verifies that this payload is signed with a private key that is not present in the backdoor, which means even though we now know basically how the backdoor works, no one else can do anything with it because we don't have the private key that, it's, that these signatures are signed with. The other interesting thing is that the payload is specific to the target. Some of the signed material includes the hash of the SSH host key. And this means that they could produce payloads that could only be used against a specific machine. And that's kind of important if you're a malicious actor. It means that if someone is able to intercept one of these payloads, they can't use it against any other targets because it only works against that specific machine. 
which means the attackers retain control of this forever. Now, the function that does the lookups to see whether RSA public decrypt is there takes some time. It was not implemented in a particularly ideal way. And that took time, which means CPU usage. Uh, those of you who have ever run a system that's on the public internet, you've probably seen that you get a lot of traffic telling you that um, you're rejecting a lot of SSH login attempts every second. Uh, backdoor SSH means more background CPU usage because every time a new SSHD is spun up to handle the new incoming connection, the backdoor is loaded again, and that takes about half a second. Uh, so a developer called uh, Andres Freund, uh, Freund uh, was trying to benchmark PostgreSQL and was noticing that his benchmarks were unstable. Running the same benchmark more than once took differing amounts of time, and then noticed that this was because SSHD was taking a lot of CPU time in the background, which meant that his system wasn't quiet enough for his um, benchmarks to be reliable. We got extremely lucky, firstly, that he noticed this, and secondly, that he decided to dig into what was going on there. In terms of timing, um, this lands in Debian testing in time for it to be automatically pulled into Ubuntu 24.04, which was going to be the next long-term support release of Ubuntu, LibSystemD was at the same time being rewritten so that it did not directly link to LibXZ, but would instead open LibXZ only if something made use of that functionality, which meant the next version of LibSystemD would no longer pull LibXZ into SSHD. So there was a small window where this could land, where this could actually end up in distributions where it would make a difference. And it landed in that window. The backdoor was buggy. Um, anything that lib linked against libxz would suddenly, if run under Valgrind, would trigger invalid memory accesses. And people looked at this, reported this to the maintainer, and he was, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a bug in the iFunk implementation, let me fix this. Made a bunch of changes that actually did basically nothing, but landed a commit that was supposedly, this is what fixes the Valgrind thing, and at the same time, uploaded a new copy of the test file that had a fixed bug fix in it. So if you'd actually built just with the patch that normally fixed this, you would find that the issue still occurred, but if you included the patch that landed a few minutes later, then it would be gone. And so everyone was, oh, 5.6.0 had this bug, 5.6.1 didn't. It was fixed by this patch that asserts it fixed that problem. So that was a opportunity for people to notice that something was weird and we missed it. When I say we, uh, to be clear, I was not involved in any of this. I was, um, I've been following along with various people on some of the reverse engineering work, but I was not part of the response to this in any way. So lessons learned from this. Um, security is really hard, especially in the face of a sophisticated actor. Uh, the Jiatan identity, um, the name is clearly supposed to evoke uh, China or Taiwan, uh, but the behavior, the timing of commits is much more consistent with working hours in Eastern Europe. Also, commits carries on happening over the Lunar New Year, uh, which would not really be expected otherwise. Humans are exploitable. Um, the fact that an open source maintainer of a critical project was kind of burnt out made it possible for malicious actors to get themselves into a position of trust in the project. And sometimes we just get lucky. The reason we noticed this was not because any of our security infrastructure was so well designed that it picked up on this. It's that one person looked at something, thought, huh, that's weird, and kept on digging. And that is it. I don't really have a particularly strong message for how we avoid this in future. <laughs> Uh, if any of you have one, it would be great. Uh, obviously, paying open source maintainers, that doesn't actually necessarily fix anything because the amount of money that open source maintainers are often paid to do this does not make up for the amount of crap that they have to deal with anyway. Uh, but just trying to ensure that we have infrastructure to ensure that when people say, I'm kind of burned out on this, there are better ways for us to make sure that they get support, that we are able to help them out with things. Also, if you are filing a bug, if you would like a feature to be added, please don't be a dick. That's just...
the single biggest thing we could probably do, do to improve the health of uh, mental health of open source developers to reduce the risk of this kind of thing happening in future is just to ensure that we do not allow this sort of abusive behavior to occur in communities without just stepping up and saying, this is inappropriate, please do not act this way, and make it clear that we are there to support to maintain that rather than the person behaving in this way. Anyway, thank you very much.